unbelief in Christ is the mother of all sins. Unbelief in Christ is what will send people to hell. Unbelief in Christ is what will make people to suffer judgment. Unbelief in Christ is what already condemns you as a person. Every other sin comes under the umbrella of unbelief in Christ Jesus. Why are Christians still struggling in sin and overcome in sin? It is because God does not condemn anybody god only convicts and let me give you a scripture for that john 3 17 says for god did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved if you feel condemned that is not god condemning you your heart can actually condemn you because you know yourself you know the things you've done you know when you do bad your conscience is there and then you feel bad you feel condemned and judged for the bad thing you've done it is not God condemning you. You only feel condemned. God only convicts. Maybe that feeling comes to you as condemnation because you've heard voices that feel like, make you feel like it's God that condemns you because you feel bad about the things you did. God only convicts you to bring you to repentance. Why does God not condemn? Because God knows that condemnation means you are banished. Condemnation means you are judged already. There's no more hope for you. So God only convicts because the essence of his conviction is to bring you home, bring you back, win your heart. Even if you felt condemned and your heart condemned you and you feel like you do not deserve God, that is not God condemning you. And I want to let you know that God is greater than your heart even though your heart condemns you this is one thing you have to put in mind god convicts you in love to win your heart not to banish you from his presence the conviction of god is so that it can win your heart it can have you back to come to a place of repentance and for every christian all of us need the conviction of god in our life daily because we are living on earth and we are prone to making mistakes we are prone to erring because we are humans to err is human god has already forgiven us of all our sins through christ this is very heavy because legalistic people are not going to believe this legalistic people are going to fight this oh why would you say that all your sins have been forgiven it is the truth of the gospel Christ died for all sins and when Christ died, he died outside of time so that all sins could be forgiven totally. When Christ died, I was already in the future. So it is not my past sin that is forgiven when I am forgiven, when I accept him. It is all my sins. So now what does this do to me? It does not give me a license to want to go and sin. It actually gives me a conviction to hold on to, like Paul said, that now I am living for Christ. The life I live in the flesh, I do not live by my own strength. I live by faith in the son of God who died for me and gave himself for me. That is the posture it brings out of me because now I am living to honor him. Anybody that claims to accept the grace of God and live under the grace of God and is enjoying to sin, that person is not yet saved. They were actually looking for excuse to live a promiscuous life, to live whatsoever kind of life they wanted to live, to live based on their own making, not to honor God. So now that they want to use the grace of God as excuse for sin, they are just wasting their time because that is not what the grace of God brings. And that was the argument Paul always did have, especially in Romans. Like in Romans 6, when it was questioned, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, if you are dead to sin already, why would you live to it? If you are dead to something, a dead man or a dead body, there's nothing you can do to a dead body that it can give you a reaction. So there's no temptation given to a dead man that will make it wake up because it is dead. So if we have died to sin and we are living for Christ, then sin can no more pull us because we are not under sin, but we are under grace. Romans 6, 14. In my experience growing up, I did not understand the conviction of God. All I ever felt was condemnation because all I was taught was this legalistic teaching and legalistic way of looking at God, like God is with a mean face. That big man upstairs with a mean face looking down on me. Like, if I knock you now. <laughs> and, and it's always like, your sin will find you out. God will find you out. They give you this message as if they are sending you straight to hell. Because this message are not out of love. They are out of threat. They are threatening you to accept Christ. That you might have an accident tomorrow. You should accept Christ now. That somebody that I preached to, I told them to give their life to Christ. And now I heard about the story that they had an accident and they died in the spot. They had no opportunity. So you should give your life to Christ right now so that you will not die. I'm like, it doesn't even resonate. You are trying to use fear to drag people to God. That is not the way. That is not Christ. That is not God. 
Condemnation will not bring them to God. Condemnation will only bring them for their own self. Because everybody who is wise, if they believe what you say, they are only coming to protect themselves, not because they love God. So they are coming. That's what religion breeds. When people are legalistic and religious, they preach these sermons that bite people on the heart, beat people up, and almost like they were at gunpoint. Accept Christ now because you might die tomorrow. So now the person decides to like, okay, I accept. <laughs> I accept. Jesus, I'm so sorry. I give my life to you. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> Forgive my impressions. You see people crying at altar call, crying tears, all full tears. But reality is, check them tomorrow and they are back to where they were because it was not a message of the love of God. It's only the love of God that transforms us. It is the love of God that compels us to live for him. It is the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. It is not the fear of judgment that will make us live for God. The fear of judgment only makes us pretend and come with the religious cloak so that we would be safe because we are trying to protect ourselves, self-preservation. That is what religion gets to make people get into that mood. Let me preserve and protect myself because I, I don't want to die. So let me accept this Christ. If, if they say it's the way that because of him, I will not die. Let me accept him. You need to come to him in love and know that he does not condemn you. He does not condemn you. Coming to know God personally, I've realized that God is not angry at me. Even when I fail, God is like, I'm still faithful. Even when you are unfaithful. That's the scripture. Even when we are unfaithful, even if we will deny him, that's the gospel that Paul was preaching. Even if we will deny him and say, I don't want to follow you. He is still faithful. He won't deny himself. He's still going to be faithful. If he wants to protect you, he will still protect you. That's why many of us would have been long gone if God is what we presented to us. Because we failed God time without number. You might say it wasn't like in a big screen, like you were not going to be a prostitute or this and that. But you were like all these lies up and down, all these little, little things that you're doing, calling little sins. We would have been long gone. But God is faithful. Even in our unfaithfulness, this is why you should know that when God convicts you of any wrong thing, he is trying to win your heart. His aim is to win your heart. His aim is to win your trust back to him. His aim is to tell you, do not be religious. I did not make you to be religious. And all this threat and force and fear and coercion is not the gospel. So I can tell you this, that God is not thrown off because you commit sin or fail. It could sound somehow, but then it is the truth. God is not like shocked, surprised thrown off oh i'm so angry at you right now why would you sin god is not have you ever read about cain if you want to argue about this cain the brother that killed his brother the first murderer on earth he killed his brother literally killed his brother and then god went to him now what i want you to focus on is god's disposition towards cain abel went to give sacrifice and cain they both gave sacrifices to god a gift god didn't ask them to give they gave it as a gift now after giving their gift Abel's gift was accepted and Abel was accepted. Cain was not accepted and his gift. Now God went to him to convict him. Why are you so angry? Because Cain was angry. The Lord asked Cain, Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. This is a holy and loving conviction. God was here trying to convict Cain to win his heart if you do right you'll be accepted of course if you are a christian and then god convicts you of a wrongdoing if you were to do right you would not feel that way if you were to do right there would be no need for dejection and anger but because you've not done right god is convicting you to save your life god is convicting you to tell you sin is crouching at your door and it's eager to control you and that is the reality that we should come to sin is always eager to control us sin is always eager to subdue us but god said to cain but you must subdue it and be its master it's a must he used the word must you must you have to subdue it and be its master because if you don't it will subdue you and cain did not listen to god cain went ahead and did what he wanted to do called his brother to the field killed his brother and when god went back to him god was still loving god was not like oh i told you now i'm gonna slay you god did not slay me immediately what i expected when god went back to cain was like just punish him like no need to give this guy an audience because he knew what he was doing and he did it but then god is not me so god is loving 
God went back to him and said, Who is your brother? Abel. And he said, Am I my brother's keeper? Just look at Cain's disposition and look at God's disposition. God is loving, but Cain is like, Don't do that with me. Don't convict me. Don't try to convict me. Am I my brother's keeper? I'm not going to even talk with you. I believe had it been Cain surrendered and went on his knee, maybe God would have forgiven him. But he did not. Immediately, Cain was like, Am I my brother's keeper? And then he faced the consequences of his action. Same thing happened with David. David killed Uriah, took his wife after he slept with his wife, and then God went to him with a loving tone, sent Prophet Nathan. That's in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Prophet Nathan, sent by God, went to David with a loving story of conviction to convict him. And he told him this loving story. You can read the story so that you would know about two people. The other one had much and this one didn't have much. And the one that had much went to the person that had little and took his little. And David was so convicted and said, who would be that man that would do such a thing in my kingdom? That man needs to be killed. And then God said, you are the man. The king that has many wives, the king that has so much, but then it is that little poor man, that little poor man's wife is the one you, you went to hijack. And when God called David out, David went on his knee and you see his prayer of repentance in Psalms 51. You can read that Psalms also. So now I'm pointing to you the nature of God and how he convicts us lovingly because all God is about is to win our hearts. God does not want to condemn us and throw us in hell. God wants to win our hearts because when he has our heart, every blessing he has for us, he wants to give us. The Bible says, blessed be the Lord God who daily loads us with benefits. I will point you to this next thing, condemnation kills. If you're someone that believes in condemning people, in judging people, that's why even Jesus said that, do not judge so that you'll not be judged because God does not just judge people. God convicts us to win our heart. That doesn't mean don't call people out, don't point out their faults, but there is a tone that is judgmental and there is a tone that is loving. And what God does with conviction is to bring a loving look to even our failings, to win our hearts, to make us see ourselves because conviction will save your life. Conviction is when you are called out for something, somebody tells you your fault so that you can see your fault. Maybe you did not see it, and you are being told this is your fault and you can see it. The best thing you can do when you see your fault is to repent, not to argue. When God calls out your fault and convicts you, do not argue, repent, turn to God. If somebody calls out your fault and you know you were wrong, immediately apologize and repent. But we have a lot of Christians, I mean, I believe they are religious Christians because any Christian that is truly saved by grace and understands the gospel of the grace of God we will not be in a place that when they are being convicted, they now want to start defending themselves. They now want to stand in a place of like, no, I know I was right. Their self-righteousness is what will kill them. And God does not deal with self-righteous people. He allows them because he knows it's like a man that is given a rope and he wants to hang himself with that rope that is given to him. Let's talk about this next point, the mother of all sins. Jesus called this very sin, the mother of all sins. In John chapter 16, verse 8 to 9, it says, and when he comes, talking about the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of its sin without is, which is sin as a noun, and of God's righteousness and of coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. This was Jesus speaking. The mother of all sin is the sin of unbelief. Unbelief in Christ is the mother of all sins. Unbelief in Christ is what will send people to hell. Unbelief in Christ is what will make people to suffer judgment. Unbelief in Christ is what already condemns you as a person, as a human. So it is not the sin of adultery, of fornication, of um, homosexuality or whatsoever thing. Every other sin comes under the umbrella of unbelief in Christ Jesus. By the time you do not believe in the finished work of Christ Jesus, you will now be open to all these other sins, fornication, masturbation, adultery, pornography, and whatsoever thing. All these other sins are under the umbrella of this murder of all sins, the sin of unbelief. Why are Christians still struggling in sin and overcome in sin? It is because they are still living a life of unbelief in Christ and in the finished work and the grace of God that was supplied. Because they believe that they can do it by themselves. Their willpower, will, will, they will overcome the sin. Anytime I want to let it go, I can let it go. That is your self-righteousness speaking. And that is what keeps you in a place of unbelief in the grace of God and the finished work that Christ has done and paid for you. That is why you are in sin. Scripture says, sin 
shall not have dominion because we are not under the law but under grace. It is until you are under the grace of God that is when sin loses its power. The power of sin is the law. And when you think you can keep the law, you can do it by your own strength and effort to be righteous before God, that is when you fail. That is when you fall. And that is the place of unbelief. And this unbelief is the mother of all sins. There are a lot of people who have professed that Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. But really, they are living a life of unbelief in the finished work of the same Jesus they call their personal Lord and Savior. Because sometimes when people say believe in Jesus and give your life to Jesus, they do not even go deep into what do you believe in Jesus about? You believe that you are saved by grace, that all the works that he did at the cross, all the things that he suffered at the cross, he was representing you. And scriptures in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 says that he that knew no sin was made to be sin, that we who were sinners should become the righteousness of God in him. So you believe that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You do not have righteousness of yourself. That is you coming to a place of belief. You believe that you are saved by grace not of works as Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 says that this is not your own doing it is all about what Christ had done that is the belief that saves your life that is the belief that God wants to convict you of convicting the world of sin sin as a noun not sin in plural but as a noun sin as a noun it is the word in Greek, amatia. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right but it means missing the mark what mark are we missing if you are still finding yourself being overcome by sin, you are missing the mark because you do not believe that Christ paid the price for you to be saved. The song says, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. It means Jesus has paid all the price. I have nothing else to pay. All I need to do is to come under the grace of God, believe in what Jesus has done, accept the grace of God and the righteousness that is provided and supplied for me, and then I live a life of freedom. But this is so hard for religious and legalistic people to believe and to accept because it seems almost difficult for them to come to that realization. And that is the devil trying to keep them in a place of unbelief so that they can still be wallowing in sin and be doing trial and error with sin. Again, I will show you the nature of Christ in the New Testament, which is the nature of God that he does not condemn, but he convicts. In John chapter 8, from verse 9 to 11, I want you to go and read it. You see the story of this woman that was caught in the act of adultery. And this man brought the woman without the man to come and blame her to Jesus. And they condemned the woman. Now Jesus looked at them and said, any of you that is without sin, cast the first stone. Mm, so convicting he didn't try to fight them with his words be like why would you bring the woman without the man where is the man and all of that he didn't ask them any question he said any of you that is without sin cast the first stone from the eldest to the youngest they all were convicted and they all left jesus looked up at the woman and said to her where are your accusers and all of them had left she said no one lord and then he said to her this is from him. He was the only one who could condemn her because he had no sin. And that was why he was the only one who could remain there. He said to her, I too, I do not condemn you. He gave her the gift of no condemnation. That is so convicting. Woo! He said, I'm not condemning you. I'm not judging you. I'm not banishing you from my presence, from the presence of God. I'm not saying that yours is done that you've done the final sin. We humans, we love to condemn and counsel people and judge people and tell people your own is done. You've done the final one, like no more redemption for you. But Jesus looked at the woman and said, I have no condemnation for you. All I have is love, 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 love. I love you. Go and sin no more. That was so convicting. And that is the power that will help her to let go of sin. So I want you to hear this again. When God convicts you, he loves you. He wants to save your life. Conviction from God is a loving correction that a loving father would give to his son or his daughter. Revelation chapter 3 verse 19, Christ said, I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. So when God corrects you by convicting you, you have to just repent and go to him, turn to him. Don't feel condemned. Just know that it is out of love. I have so many instances in the bible i can pull up but because of time i'm not going to go into all of that peter denied knowing jesus and then jesus looked at him with a convicting look before he was crucified after he was crucified he met up with peter and then he convicted him peter do you love me 
He said, I love you. He asked him, do you love me? He said, I love you. He asked him, do you love me? Peter said, oh, no. <laughs> Peter was hot. And at this point, he was convicted. I don't think I love him like, like I thought, thinking to himself. And then he said, you know, I love you as a friend. I don't really love you that deep. It's only, I want to receive your love. It's only you that can love that agape, unconditional love. I can't love you that way. Let me receive that your love. And he said, fit my ship. He convicted Peter, won his heart. So whenever God brings conviction to you, when God convicts you, God wants to win your heart. God doesn't want to banish you. John 3, 20 to 21 says, All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. This is not to condemn anyone, but this is to tell you if you are a believer and you are afraid of conviction, you are afraid of being called out for a wrongdoing, you are afraid of being vulnerable to people so that they will not even see and call out your wrongdoing, your fault, then you are in the wrong place. You should aim to come to a place that you can easily be vulnerable and tell a trusted person your life and let them call you out in a place that you might have blind spots and come to the light with everything so that you can see that whatever you are doing is what God wants. It is what honors God. That's where I would end today's video. And I will tell you again, do not fear conviction from God and also know that God can never condemn you. God loves you. I am Uwem. This is my YouTube channel. I hope that this video is a blessing to you. Let me know in the comment section how this video has blessed you. And then I would love to chat with you in the comments. Thank you. Blessings. Bye.